Well, hello, it's Bruce Williams again. It's time for part nine of my series on the selected gross pathology of the dog. We'll take a quick run through pathology of the reproductive system. But before we start, I want to thank all my friends and colleagues who provided me such fantastic images that have allowed me to put this lecture series together. Well, anyone that's been in clinical practice is going to recognize this lesion. Pyometra is the filling of the uterus with purulent material. Pyometra usually occurs several weeks after estrus because the cervix has to be open for bacteria to ascend. There are a couple of other cases in which closed cervices uh, will precede uh, pyometra if the infection occurs in pregnancy when the placenta is a target, as may occur with cases of brucellosis in which erythritol, sugar produced by placenta, will cause those bacteria to hone in on the placenta. My old friend John King used to say that this type of exudate, sort of this brownish to hemorrhagic exudate, is more characteristic of coliform bacteria, bacteria from the feces which are omnipresent in the environment and can contaminate a uterus with an open cervix. Staph and strep are also common causes of pyometra, but generally result in a creamier, whitish, more tenacious exudate. Bacterial endometritis may also result in cystic endometrial hyperplasia, which we'll look at in just a minute if they don't proceed to overt pyometra. William's rules of bubbles, number one, is that if you see bubbles in the slide, you should at least for a moment consider that you may be looking at cystic endometrial hyperplasia of the uterus. This takes place with two important predisposing factors. Number one is progesterone, especially after esterous, which provides a good, good environment for bacteria to grow. A small dose of bacteria can provide the type of irritation in the face of progesterone to result in cystic endometrial hyperplasia. Uh, you can also induce this lesion by trauma or irritation to the uterine lining during this period. Intrauterine devices have long incited this kind of change and use for birth control. Histologically, the lining epithelium, the cysts, is generally heavily vacuolated, the so-called progestational change. And there's very little change in the rest of the uterus, maybe some edema in the submucosa, but not elsewhere. This can also be seen in a number of species as an aging change, probably most common in mice and rats. Uh, in mice over 15 months of age, it's uh, uncommon not to see this finding, and it's especially uh, profound in some species of mice. This lesion may be either focal or diffuse, and if you look at it, it's sort of shiny and glisten glistening. If there was uh, pyometra, it'd be sort of dull and covered with exudate. This generally occurs after estrus because estrogen priming is required because it makes endometrial cells express receptors for progesterone, which is the major trigger for this condition. Oh, here's a wonderful picture um, by Dr. Jay Kohler of Auburn University of serosal cysts on the serosal lining of the uterus. These are uncommon findings of no real clinical significance. You can often see cysts in the dog around the ovaries as well. Well, here's a great lesion. Uh, that's seen in the dog. The, the normal involution of the dog uterus occurs within 
12 to 15 weeks. But in some, especially smaller breeds of dogs, this may not occur for various reasons. You will see a bloody vaginal discharge. If we look at the shoes have been opened up and you can see the zonary attachment site here and the entire uterus is covered with a thick layer of fibrin and has hemorrhaging. And the problem here is that the trophoblasts have not died off and, and the death of the trophoblasts is required for the re-epithelialization of the uterine lining. Um, these dogs may end up being anemic due to a persistent bloody vaginal discharge. This may predispose to pyometra, but obviously is cured if the animal is spayed. So normal involution, 12 to 15 weeks. All the trophoblasts should be gone within several weeks. And there is a process uh, which is fairly stereotypical of the sloughing of the uterine mucosa and the reestablishment of a normal and new mucosa, which does not happen. This is called subinvolution of placental sites. Oh, moving on to the to the male side of the house, uh, a common lesion in older dogs, also seen in older men, is uh, hyperplasia and hypertrophy of the prostate gland. The dog is the only species except man with any uh, appreciable prostatic disease, um, except for maybe the ferret, but that requires uh, estrogen and progesterone secretion from a hyperfunctional adrenal gland, and that's a very different type of condition. This particular condition is often seen in older animals. Um, it is age and testosterone dependent, does not occur, occur in any appreciable uh, frequency in castrated dogs. And uh, unlike in older men, it doesn't seem to interfere with urine flow and obstruction is extremely rare. Uh, when you look at the prostate, uh, a, if you give a dog androgen, and why you would, I have no idea, but if you want to, then you can cause hyperplasia of the glandular elements as seen here. Uh, the administration of estrogen will cause uh, hyperplasia of the stroma, um, it's sort of a fibromuscular hyperplasia with uh, atrophy of the glandular elements, and that's uh, a key treatment for hyperplasia of the prostate or prostatic cancer in humans. The administration of estrogen leads to squamous metaplasia of the prostate gland, which in itself can cause some problems. So that's a, a bit of a tricky deal, but benign prostatic hyperplasia. Prostate here, a little bilobed prostate, and bladder here. Intersex abnormalities, uh, hermaphrodites, and the more common pseudo-hermaphrodites. Uh, true hermaphrodites generally have a combination of both uh, testicular and ovarian elements within the gonads. Pseudohermaphrodite is a situation in which gonadal sex, or the presence of the gonad, the internal, often internal gonads, is different than the presentation of the external genitalia. For example, uh, an animal may have a rudimentary uterus with uh, testes hanging off of it, and then the external genitalia may be a female in nature. This is a enlarged clitoris, a so-called penile clitoris that may be seen uh, in these animals with testosterone secretion on top of female genitalia. The, the pseudohermaphrodites um, arise from a, a wide range of genetic abnormalities, as do hermaphrodites, and, and I've covered that more in a series on the uh, uh, pathology of the reproductive tract in uh, across animal species. Uh, you see this uh, not uncommonly in goats and maybe horses in uh, the dog. The miniature schnauzer appears to be overrepresented as a breed with intersex 
abnormalities. If you want to learn more about this, I would refer you to the Foundation's YouTube channel or the JPC Video Library to review the lecture on intersex abnormalities. Okay, a great picture of a neoplasm of the prostate in a dog. And now, back in the days before immunohistochemistry, many of these neoplasms were coded out as prostatic adenocarcinoma. Since the advent of immunohistochemistry, we have realized that quite a few of these tumors are actually of urothelial origin. And the prostatic urethra appears to be the number one site of uh, origin of transitional cell carcinomas of the urinary tract more than anything else. So a lot of these are invasive. They go up into the prostate and the prostatic tumor is actually a transitional cell carcinoma. So I always recommend every time you are looking at a tumor in the prostate of a dog, run a uroplakin 3. A lot of times it'll turn out that's transitional cell carcinoma. There are prostatic adenocarcinomas out there. I don't know if there are any good markers for that in the dog. In our laboratory, uh, prostate-specific antigen does not seem to label well, but it may simply be that it hasn't been optimized for the dog. But prostatic cancer is very uncommon in dogs. Remember that <clears throat> and that it's the number one site for transitional cell carcinoma to arise in male dogs. And you won't make that mistake. Moving on to the testes, before we get into testicular tumors, um, this is a testis with a severe case of epididymitis. It is diffuse. It's not focal. If they're focal at the head of the uh, epididymis, those are often sperm granulomas, but these, this severe uh, hemorrhagic uh, epididymitis is much more consistent with infectious disease. These are extremely painful processes. The animal will try and traumatize uh, its scrotum, and uh, it is Sometimes, and we don't see this much in this country anymore, but uh, hematogenous infection by Brucella canis will cause an epididymitis in an intact dog. Um, I'm sure that this is not uncommon in other countries of the world. Um, or it can be an ascendic infection due to E. coli or some other coliform coming down as part of a, a complex with prostatitis. The, within these areas, you'll get a lot of inflammation, then you'll get ruptures of tubules, which lead to formation of granulomas as well. Uh, ultimately, you will get uh, an orchitis. You may get a rupture of the inflammation within the vaginal tunics. Um, so look, don't forget to look for that uh, concurrent prostatitis. And what would a lecture on the repro system of the dog be without a quick review of the three most common testicular tumors in the dog? Of this particular one, the fact that this is hemorrhage, they're often sort of clear. I mean, they may match the color of the testicle, but the presence of hemorrhage or necrosis is pretty classic for the most common neoplasm of the dog testis, the interstitial cell tumor. It's most common in dogs, cats, and bulls if you are keeping track. Um, there are small lesions, often less than this, one centimeter. Some people call those hyperplastic lesions. What is the significance of these tumors? Uh, basically none. You can see them bilaterally as well. You can see them in conjunction with other different neoplasms of the testis. Um, they do not tend to metastasize and castration is curative. They're also often found as incidental findings. So look for areas of hemorrhage or areas of necrosis which may manifest as cystic areas within these particular tumors. Um, their sort of yellowish appearance arises from the fact that they manufacture steroids. And so because the 
number one component of a steroid is fat. They often have a yellow-orange uh, appearance. Fat isn't normally yellow-orange, but when it is oxidized in the process of making steroids, it undergoes a color change. So these are yellow-orange tumors. The tumors that are sort of bulgy, uh, uncut section, they are, have been described as white like fish flesh or seminomas. They will bulge on cut sections. They almost look a little like lymphomas because they don't make any stroma. There's no fibrous connective tissue. They just sort of, once they break out of the tubules, they just, you know, it's cell upon cell. They, they multiply in sheets. So when you cut them, they sort of bulge up because there's nothing really holding them together. They do not generally have uh, any hemorrhage within them. And uh, once again, this is a uh, common tumor in a number of species, uh, maybe the most common in the horse, and very rarely can cause metastatic lesions, probably best identified in humans, but uh, um, especially in lower vertebrates, uh, fish seem to get a whole lot of seminomas, but once again, common in dogs, you can see them in concert with interstitial cell tumors or any other type of tumor. The third type of tumor is a Sertoli cell tumor. And you can often identify Sertoli cell tumors for a number of reasons. One, they tend to have a lot of fibrous connective tissue, so they often will be abnormal in contour. Um, they will be sort of contracted. They are white and firm and hard on incision. Um, this is a neoplasm in which uh, the majority of them are seen in undescended testes as well. And they do liberate a number of hormones. They actually liberate a lot of inhibin, which causes an imbalance in uh, hormone production. And so male dogs may uh, secrete estrogen instead of testosterone. This results in gynecomastia, um, and this dog may be attractive to other male dogs on the block. This inhibin secretion just alters the production ratio between testosterone and estrogen. You may also see the uh, other signs of hyperestrogenism in these animals, including uh, hair loss, prostatic disease. We said that, that uh, uh, estrogen secretion will cause squamous metaplasia of the prostate. You may have cysts, which contain separative material because the body does not like keratin, and it puts all your keratin on the outside of the body. It does tend to stimulate a significant keratin within the skin, um, tends to stimulate a very profound separative response. And then also, uh, in severe cases, you may have longstanding estrogenism to result in bone marrow suppression in these particular animals, sir. So totally cell tumors. There, there are mixed tumors, uh, mixed or totally uh, Leydig cell tumors. Um, and most of these uh, have components of both that cannot be sorted out individually. And I always find those particular tumors very challenging. Um, I like a good classic interstitial cell or seminoma or Sertoli cell, but it seems that I get a lot of the, the mixed ones, which can be tough to sort out. Uh, finally, a great picture by Dr. Arnon Gal. Um, and this is a developmental disease that is seen in male animals and seen in a number of species, including human babies. And this is hypospadias. You can see that the uh, uh, ventral surface of the external genitalia is missing. So you can look down into the prepuce. You can actually look down into the urethra. The scrotum is not formed. It's a, what's known as a bifid or a bifid uh, scrotum. And there's really no scrotum in the testes or essentially in the inguinal canal. Hypospadias, a uh, fairly common uh, genetic defect in some species. Uh, goats seem to be uh, uh, get this 
fairly commonly. Well, that uh, concludes this particular lecture. We kept it down to 20 minutes, which is sort of a record for me. We thanks for uh, for hanging in here. Um, if you are interested, look for the uh, uh, pathology of the reproductive tract on our YouTube channel. There's a number of hours of uh, good information covering all animal species in that one. I hope you come back for the last couple of lectures in this particular series. We've not yet covered the respiratory tract, and we'll finish up with the urinary tract of the dog in coming lectures. As always, I wish you wonderful health and a wonderful day.